Happy Death Day, the 2017 teen slasher movie. It's Groundhog Day meets Scream. Or is it? We'll get to that. In this video, we're going to journey into the deeper meaning of this film and its sequel, Happy Death Day to You. We'll be thinking about their symbolism. We'll be thinking about the entanglement between birth and death and how these films connect to various philosophies and theologies from around the world and down through history. We'll be thinking about the multiverse and what that means for storytelling. But wait, I hear you cry. These are just campy Blumhouse flicks. They don't have anything deeper going on. Oh, just you wait. Okay, here goes. If you think about it, birthdays are weird. Because your birthday celebrates the day you were born. The more birthdays you celebrate, the further you get from your original birthday and the closer you get to your death day. Your birthdays count up in numerical terms, but they're also counting down to the end of your life. As Guy de Maupassant wrote in his 1885 novel Bellamy, the only certainty is death, and it's getting closer and closer for every one of us. Sorry for that morbid thought, but enter Happy Death Day. Our protagonist is Teresa Gelbman. Her friends call her Tree. She wakes up with a massive hangover on Monday the 18th of September 2017. It's her birthday, and by the evening she discovers that it is also her death day. And then the day resets in the style of Groundhog Day, a reference that the film isn't afraid to invoke. You know, your little scenario reminds me. What? Uh, What's that? Groundhog Day. The movie Groundhog Day? Mm. With Bill Murray? Who's Bill Murray? We're going to enter spoiler territory. When we first meet Tree, she is the archetypal college mean girl. I made that from scratch. Sorry, too many carbs. Toodle. She's rude, she's selfish, she's having an affair with her married professor. What's with the door? Oh, stupid thing got jammed. Oh, just wrapping up here. Have you met my student, Teresa? No, I haven't. But the discombobulation of being caught in a murderous time loop starts to break down her facade. We learn that her mother died three years ago. They share the same birthday. So now this day can only serve as a painful reminder that her mother is no longer around. In a sense, Tree's birthday is already associated with death, even before the film begins. As for the time loop itself, the day is reset by Tree's death at the hands of this seemingly inescapable killer. Her death gives way to rebirth, but it's always a rebirth into the same lethal scenario. In this film, birth and death are entangled. We see that in the symbolism of the killer. The mask is the mascot of Bayfield College, the fictional setting of these two movies. It's the face of a baby. Get your school spirit on before the big game, 10% off with your student ID. Who picks a creepy baby for a mascot anyway? I knew I should have gone to MIT. And the first kill is preceded by the careful placement of a music box playing the tune Happy Birthday. So we have a birthday, we have a baby, we have a music box. These are symbols of birth, but they are wielded by a killer with a black hoodie and a knife. Symbols of death. In this film, birth and death are entangled, and that's a problem, because life and death cannot be conflated. They're incompatible. Eventually, one must win out. It's symbolic, okay? Whoever's killing you knows it's your birthday. It becomes clear that in order to escape the time loop, Tree needs to survive the day. The time loop is a way of cheating death and bringing her back to the start of the day, but it's not a way of moving beyond death. She needs to avoid death altogether, and she stands a better chance of doing that if she can identify the killer. All right, look, the way I see it is, is you have unlimited amount of lives, so you have unlimited opportunities to solve your own murder. So I'm just supposed to keep dying until I figure out who my killer is? That's your genius plan. Do you have a better idea? This, of course, is easier said than done, as demonstrated through the use of a classic cinematic device, the montage. We feel Tree's frustration as she painstakingly works her way through a list of suspects. This excerpt from the ancient text of Ecclesiastes captures her experience perfectly. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. You see, Tree is experiencing a heightened version of what we all experience. The reality of life under the sun. It's frustrating, it's exhausting, it's cyclical. Another day, another dollar. 
Of course, for us, the day isn't literally looping as it is in the film, but life is certainly repetitive, and on a broader scale, history has a way of repeating itself. One empire topples, another rises, and we have yet to witness a war to end all wars. Now, there's an interesting apparent similarity between the time loop that Tree experiences and the idea of samsara that we see in religions like Hinduism and Buddhism the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. In fact, Tree even wonders whether her situation might be a result of bad karma. Know, maybe this is karma, maybe I deserve it. Karma is the idea in Hinduism and Buddhism that your fate in your current state of existence is determined by your actions in a past state of existence. As Tree comes to terms with the fact that she hasn't exactly led the best life, she starts to wonder if her predicament is some form of punishment. I'm not a good person, Carter. But this is where things start to get really interesting. You see, each time Tree dies, the day almost resets entirely, but not quite, because everything resets apart from Tree's memory or her consciousness, and thus each time she wakes up, she has a recollection of all the previous cycles. Okay, you said everything resets but your memory, right? Yeah. If this didn't happen, it wouldn't be much of a movie, would it? Because the day would just keep resetting without anyone realising and it would play out exactly the same every time. And this is where the film departs from the typical view of samsara in Eastern spiritualities. In most views of reincarnation, you don't actually have a recollection of the previous cycles, of your past lives. And therefore, if the suffering that you're experiencing in your current cycle is the result of bad karma from previous cycles, it's hard to see what remedial qualities that has. You're being punished, but you don't know what you're being punished for. So ultimately, that's not the story that the film wants to tell. It wants to weave a grander narrative throughout and beyond the cycles of life, death, and rebirth. So what are the implications of this? Well, for one thing, with each cycle, it takes a toll. The trauma begins to accumulate to the point that she's a medical anomaly. We just got these back from imaging. And these are signs of major trauma. Given the severity of the scar tissue and the size of the lesions, this is gonna sound crazy, but technically, you should be dead. So that raises the stakes of the movie. She gets weaker with each cycle, and thus the time loop resetting isn't much consolation. There is kind of a time limit to get this sorted. So you have unlimited opportunities to solve your own murder. See, that's just it. I don't think I have that many chances left. I keep on getting weaker every time I come back. So maybe I'm like that cat with nine lives. Eventually I'm gonna run out. But the good news in all this is that even though the world is repeating itself all around her, Tree has the capacity to change, or should I say, grow. According to director Christopher Landon, this is the thinking behind her name. He says, trees need to grow, and you see this character go from one person to another. So there's some symbolism and parallels there. This is a question at the centre of the human condition. Is there hope? Is there hope that we can move forward beyond the entrapment of endless cycles? Is there more than life under the sun, the circle of life? Is there more than the life of frustration? Can we get something better than what we deserve? The writer of Ecclesiastes believed so, as have many throughout history. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. His thinking was profoundly shaped by his Christian faith. He believed in a better tomorrow. And we instinctively want to join him in that belief. Now, of course, in that speech, Martin Luther King Jr. is talking about the arc of the moral universe over the scale of history in the context of the American civil rights movement. And I certainly don't want to trivialise that by bringing it up in this review of Happy Death Day. But the reason I mention it is that this belief in progress, be it on the scale of history, be it on the scale of our personal lives, that is not a universal or obvious belief. It's an act of faith. 
We're really hoping that things can get better, and we're searching for a foundation for that hope. It's a hope that Happy Death Day cannot help but express in some small way. Tree represents so many modern college students, albeit in a slightly caricatured way, that's the tone of the film. She wants to live life to the full and pursue the university dream of parties, promiscuity, but deep down she's struggling with regrets, she's struggling with grief. The time loop forces her to confront that reality. It's a pressure cooker a crucible, and it is in this context that she learns maybe there's more to life. Superimposed on all those repeating cycles, the story has a shape, an arc. What does that look like? Well first, things get worse before they get better. Tree is brought low, she's brought to a realisation of her failures. You know, it's funny, you relive the same day over and over again, you kind of start to see who you really are. My mom saw me now, you know, who I've become. I don't think she'd be very proud. Don't say that. It's true. I'm not a good person, Carter. But at her lowest point, she is joined in the pit by a beautiful stranger. A man who, despite initial impressions, did not take advantage of her the night before. His name is Carter. Okay, mister, I'm gonna take this drunk home and take advantage of her, don't you? For the record, I didn't take advantage of you last night, okay? I slept on Ryan's bed. So... We didn't have- No, you were wasted last night. I was afraid you were gonna fall or choke on your own vomit like Janis Joplin. Carter seems to ignite something inside her, to the point that during one of the cycles when Carter dies in order to save her, she has an opportunity to kill the person she thinks is the killer, and thus break the time loop, or so she thinks at that point, but she chooses not to because she doesn't want to go back to normal life if Carter's not going to be there with her. So in order to save Carter, she resets the loop. You see, Tree is going through something of a transformation, and the film makes it clear that that's not something she's bringing about by herself. It's because she has fallen in love with this beautiful stranger, and he has inspired in her a new sense of joy and purpose which she cannot help but share with others. She ends the affair she was having, she makes things right with her dad, and now there's hope that there can be a better tomorrow. Well in Tree's case all she wants is for tomorrow to actually arrive, for the time loop to, to end, but she also wants to go into tomorrow a transformed person. There are a couple of final twists, the real killer turns out not to be the escaped prisoner, Tombs, but Tree's flatmate, Lori, and once that's dealt with we can have a happy ending. Now inevitably the film's view of what life to the full actually is, is going to be incomplete, but the film's decision to place human relationships and bonds of love at the centre of its vision for life makes a refreshing change from the expressive individualism and be who you want to be that we hear so frequently. In the 2019 sequel Happy Death Day to You, it transpires that the time loops of both movies are actually a result of Ryan's science experiment, a quantum reactor. This also explains the power outages of the first movie. Ryan's machine is called Sisyphus, after the figure from Greek mythology who cheats death and then is condemned to push a boulder up a hill again and again and again for eternity. So that's a nice connection to draw to Tree's predicament. Tree is somewhat disappointed to discover this explanation. It's ironic. Here I thought I was stuck in the same day for some big cosmic reason. I'm facing my mom's death. I had nothing to do with her. Turns out it was just some big scientific fluke. This nicely demonstrates our post-enlightenment thinking. We now assume that if something has a scientific explanation, it is explained entirely, leaving no room for any deeper meaning. If that's true, I might as well stop making these videos. But thankfully, Carter is at hand. That doesn't make it meaningless, does it? Guess not. Yes, he's right. Science is about the how. It's not about the why. And it doesn't do away with the why. With that said, we're about to venture into the multiverse, and that does create some problems. The challenge with multiverse stories is that, in a sense, everything is true, in one universe or another. In some universes you're dead, in some universes you're alive, in some universes you're more evil, in some universes you're less evil. Heck, in some universes you might even be the killer. There isn't a single true story to bind all of reality together. 
The past few years have seen a proliferation of multiverse stories, and I think they represent something of a creative dead end, a cultural fatigue and hopelessness. The internet really is everything, everywhere, all at once. We're being numbed to the world around us. We feel utterly insignificant. Multiverse stories are about making us feel even smaller. They tell us that not only is our own universe absolutely vast, it's one of potentially infinite universes within a multiverse. And it turns out that a firing of Ryan's machine has whisked Tree back into the birthday time loop of the first movie. So she's stuck in the same predicament as before, except this time she's in a different dimension and she's taken the place of her doppelganger. There's only one of you here because the other you got knocked into a parallel dimension somewhere in the multiverse. The question is, can writer-director Christopher Landon hold on to a sense of meaning in the midst of this multi-dimensional catastrophe? Well, he certainly gives it a shot. And crucially, in this dimension, Tree's mother is still alive. Tree decides to close the time loop, locking herself into this new dimension. A place where her mum is alive, but Carter isn't her boyfriend. It's a hard decision to make, but Tree can't bear the thought of losing her mother again. Carter pushes back. Are you sure about this? Of course I'm sure. Okay, well what about the killer? I mean, you said people are gonna die tonight. If you close the loop and we don't help, then they're dead for good, aren't they? People die every day, Carter. I can't be responsible for everyone, okay? I know how selfish that sounds, but it's true. Yeah, no, that sounds incredibly selfish. Are you serious? And it's words from her mother that finally cause her to change her mind. We all have to make hard choices, Tree. That's life. And sometimes the past is pulling us in one direction and the future is calling us somewhere new. And so, Tree decides to go home, back to her original dimension. You sure you want to go back? I can't spend my life living in the past. I take a leap of faith. But this unique situation does present her with an opportunity. Well, you have the chance to do something other people only dream of. What? You can say goodbye. Tree is able to live out her favorite childhood memory of sitting down with her mother to blow out the birthday candle one last time. My dad would buy us this like, huge birthday cake and put just one candle on it. we blow it out together. So the film tries to have its cake and eat it. Pardon the pun. We're living in this vast multiverse. But love matters, is what it says. I think it just about gets away with it. The best kind of love changes you. That's a good message. When I was pregnant with you, I was scared shitless. <laughs> no! But then, the moment I held you, something inside of me changed. Instantly. The best kind of love does that. It changes you. Happy Death Day to You is actually an okay sequel, because even though it reiterates the lessons of the first movie, of coming to terms with grief and love transforming a person, the stakes are raised by giving Tree the opportunity to actually see her mother again, if this figure from an alternate dimension can be called her mother. We can see why it's tempting for her to remain in the alternate reality, but we're glad she ultimately chooses to go home. And then, during a slightly uncomfortable mid credit sequence, Tree volunteers the college queen bee, Danielle, to be a test subject for a time loop at the hands of the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? Wait, you, you want to trap somebody in a time loop? That's <laughs> messed up. Unless they deserve it. Now, there is an inkling that Danielle was a co-conspirator in the attempted murder of Tree in the first film. During one particular cycle of the time loop, she was caught carrying the menacing birthday card that ended up on Tree's desk. The two of them got hit by a bus and Tree crossed Danielle off the suspect list. But it's not definitive that Danielle was innocent, so maybe this mid credit scene represents Danielle finally getting her just desserts. And maybe Tree is giving Danielle some tough love. Tree herself was transformed through the agony of being caught in a time loop. Perhaps she wants Danielle to be transformed too. So there we go. Happy Death Day. Beneath the frothy fun, I think we've seen that it actually has a few things to say. Through the agony of a time loop, a heightened life under the sun, Tree is a character who comes to realise that there is more to life. 
It's not endless cycles of life, death and rebirth. It's a transcendent journey that takes her down and then up. Only the best kind of love will change her. And in both films, this allows her to escape the time loop, come to terms with her grief, and for a moment at least, her own death is defeated. There's a happy ending. I can understand why people have linked these films to Scream. The teen slasher whodunit element is definitely there. And there is a willingness to play around with horror tropes. But Happy Death Day doesn't comment on itself in the way that Scream does. This isn't a movie. Sure it is, Sid. It's all, it's all a movie. It's all one great big movie. You can't pick your genre. And whereas Scream manages to be intense horror in its own right, Happy Death Day opts for a much more light-hearted, throwaway approach. But I can totally see why Christopher Landon was lined up to direct Scream 7 with his flair for dark comedy. It's a shame that his experience was so bad that he was driven to walk out on the project. There has been talk of a possible third Happy Death Day movie, and if it happens I might check it out. My name's Thomas Thorogood. On this channel, I explore the deeper meaning of movies, so do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop. Do leave a comment if you have any thoughts on these movies or any movies I should cover. And I can highly recommend this book, Cinemagogue, Director's Cut, by James Harleman. If you'd like to find out more about life under the sun versus the life transcendent, and how we see those play out in lots of different movies. It's a great read. James also co-hosts a sensational podcast called Popcorn Theology. So there's plenty to get stuck into over there. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.